Hello, today we're going to learn about power tools. And these tools are going to help you build something. Rhetoric is the art of persuasion. So what you're going to end up building is an argument. And rhetoric is, um, well, these tools are all rhetorical tools that help you build that argument. What I'd like you to focus on right now, though, is the word art. And if you consider, you know, the idea of trying to paint a picture, um, there's a lot of choices involved. And you might choose the paint, the actual colors. You might choose the um, way in which you apply the paint, um, the shading of the paint, the paint brushes, the different brushes you'll need to do the different techniques on the art, on the piece of artwork. And um, so when I think of art, I think of a lot of decisions that an artist makes in order to have an end effect, okay, an end product. And that's the same thing with persuasion. When you're arguing, you should be choosing very carefully how you do that. You do this by using rhetorical tools to persuade others. And we're going to learn a lot of these tools today. Writers know and understand their audience and then choose their strategies carefully for specific purposes. And one particular famous rhetorician, his name was Quintilian, he said that rhetoric is a good person speaking well. And so it's not just someone with the facts, and it's not just someone who's a good person that you trust. It's someone that has both of those qualities, the trust and the factual knowledge in order to convince you of something. And so we're going to be talking about how to be a good person and speak well in this presentation. First of all, how do, good, how do writers present themselves as good people? Okay, I put quotation marks around good. What does that really mean? Well, first of all, they sound level-headed. You know, they sound balanced, fair. Um, they, they're not um, overly dramatic. They are just very um, careful in how they present themselves. You like my little level over there? Now you get the idea of power tools, okay? The level, when you're building, it's to show if a wall or a, um, um, something you're hanging is level in, in to the eye, and so it's at the right angle. Okay, here's an example of a tool, concession. Concession is a rhetorical tool that helps a, a, a good person sound level-headed. So concession is an expression of, of concern for the feelings of those who may disagree with the writer's position and or a listing of the opponent's argument. So to sound fair, I sometimes will concede, like um, when I'm arguing with my husband. I can say, I understand you're concerned about our busy schedule this weekend. I do hear you. I understand that we have probably too much planned for Saturday morning. But, and then what I do is I refute. And the word, the noun form is refutation. This is when you counter or qualify your opponent's arguments. This is when you say your side. So by conceding, I'm saying at least to my husband, I'm listening to you. I hear everything you're saying. But, and now I'm going to refute, I think that we can manage this if we plan ahead. And so I think sometimes the best way to win an argument is to at least say what your opponent has said out loud, to list the, the, their argument out loud, and so they know that you actually did listen to them, and then to present your argument. And if, if your opponent doesn't believe you're actually even listening to them, I don't think you're able to to actually have a good conversation with them. And so you need both concession and refutation. It's kind of a two-part deal. Okay, here's an example. Dad, your love for me and concern about my safety are evident. That's the concession. But you can trust me to come straight home from the meeting. Here's another one. Mom, I know that you might consider a cell phone a distraction, but I would use it judiciously. And so I really do think the best way you can communicate sometimes with your parents is at least to acknowledge their side first and then be able to maturely, with a level head, state your side. And I think that's a good combination. 
Another way to do this is just to control your emotions. You know, if you're crying when you're trying to convince someone of something, they're probably thinking this person's immature or this person's just feeling emotion right now. They're not being a logical person. Or they're thinking this person's trying to manipulate me. It's, it's a manipulative device, this crying thing. And so if you can control your emotions when you're talking to people, you gain so much ground. You sound so much more balanced and fair and level-headed. So that's just one, a few ways to sound like a good person, a fair-minded person. Also just sounding fair, you know, the way you state facts or um, like you are trying to, you know, sound like you're listening to everybody. Those things really do matter. So on this page alone, we've had um, using concession and using refutation as rhetorical tools. Very good, very good decisions when you're making your argument. All right. A good rhetorician also sounds knowledgeable. You gotta have knowledge in order to argue a fact. By using facts, you can prove that you've done research and that you um, have a background knowledge of information, that you're prepared to um, consider all sides. Here's an example. Cell phones are not as expensive now. So like if you're trying to talk your mom and dad into getting you a new phone or getting you a first phone, that's really a fact. Sometimes cell phones are not as, as expensive now unless you're getting the very, very best one. That might be, but... Anyway, that used to be a fact. <laughs> um, another way to sound knowledgeable is to refer to an authority, but be careful. It needs to be someone, your parents, like if you were arguing with your parents, that they would trust. If you were arguing with, you know, a jury, it'd be someone they would trust. And so you have to consider your audience when you refer to an authority trying to show them your knowledge. So here's an example. Um, if I'm arguing with my mom and dad and I'm trying to get a phone, I can say, well, my responsible friend has one, and if they like that friend, they respect that friend and his or her parent, and they respect that authority person. So this would be a good example of, you know, using that knowledge and referring to authorities to win an argument. Another way is to cite the past. Here's an example. Remember when I was stuck at school? And I waited and waited. I sure could have used a phone because all the doors were locked. And so if you can cite the past to help defend what you are arguing for or against, that would be great. Another um, piece of knowledge you could use is just cause and effect. If I had a cell phone, then I would not have to use yours. You know, you, you can, you know, logically um, create these type of, you know, moments with your parents sometimes and it does make sense to them sometimes other times they know you're just trying to be ornery but here's another one use a quotation but once again i almost think you have to quote someone that the audience either knows or respects so this one may or may not work look at this one anthony robbins okay now you're probably thinking who in the world is anthony robbins well let me tell you who he is it might make this a little better of an example he was um, an authority on just living life better and being more successful, okay? And a lot of people used to read his books, okay? So I pulled a quote from him. Anthony Robbins has said that the way we communicate with others and with ourselves ultimately determines the quality of our lives. And then you could argue, if I had a cell phone, I can improve the quality of my life. Now, your parents would probably at this point know that you're trying to, you know, pull something on them. But it's actually sometimes using quotations is a very, very good way to make a point in an argument. How do writers speak well? You know, we've, we've talked about, you know, sounding fair-minded and we've sounded sounding intellectual and smart and knowing our facts. But um, another way to to be a better rhetorician is to speak well. And I have a paintbrush up there because it's almost like using words to paint pictures for the person listening to you. Okay, number one, they engage the audience in their arguments. How do they do this? They use anecdotes, short narratives, little stories detailing particulars of an interesting event. And if you can paint a picture where your listener can see it in their minds, they are won over even more because their heart is kind of, their heart um, tender emotional side is turned 
on by this picture. Okay, here's an example, like if you were arguing for a phone. One time a friend of mine, mine got lost in the mall and wandered around for two hours looking for his parents. The whole family was distraught by the time they found each other. If they had had cell phones, they would have communicated better. And so you can use a, a real life story, um, a made up story too, to make a point sometimes. You can also use imagery, the use of descriptive details that appeal to the senses because if your person can imagine um, a, and picture the story in their minds, I think it's more powerful. For example, Mom, remember watching me in the park for me in the parking lot at school? You sat in your hot car, the seat melting into your skin, the air thick and humid. If I had a cell phone, I could call you to come get me as you sip on a tangy iced tea, as you wait on a soft, comfy couch in the cool 76 degree home. So I know I milked that a little bit and really exaggerated and used a lot of description to try and manipulate, you know, the mother and, you know, just accentuate that the hot car is unpleasant and then the cool house is nice and comfortable. But um, imagery, it, it does have power. You'll see that writers use this all the time. Okay, um, good speakers and writers can also use um, figures of speech. And um, these images, you know, these comparison type images really paint nice pictures in people's heads to help them understand things better. So one type of figure of speech is a metaphor. You know a metaphor, it's a direct comparison. Um, here's, here's one, here's an example. Cell phones are a lifeline to family and friends. And I think you know that the metaphor here is lifeline. And it's comparing, you know, being hooked to, you know, one thing to the other to keep life going and cell phones really do do that sometimes. It connects us to our family and friends in a way that um, allows us to communicate and live better. Here's another one, a simile, a comparison using like or as. Cell phones are like a homing beacon that allow parents to keep track of their busy children. Now that's really true, honestly, because I do track my children on their cell phones. And I was using it as a simile here, like um, you can home in on um, things where you've got them, you know, tagged to do so. But that's a good comparison. Here's another, a personification. This is giving person, human qualities to something. Here's an example. The cell phone is a chaperone keeping me in touch with my parents. That's a nice um, image as well. It's giving that cell phone a human quality like a chaperone would have. Also, um, good writers enhance writing with sentence tools. Okay, now I'm going to stress sentence tools. And so let's look at a few of those. Repetition is a type of sentence tool. When you create your sentence, you you purposely use repetition. Some of you do this when you're writing not purposely and it, it pulls your grade down sometimes because I don't want to hear the same word over and over again. But in rhetoric, sometimes using a repeated word helps accentuate a point. So let's look at an example. A cell phone would help me be responsible. It would help me keep in touch with my family and even help me communicate with friends. And so you're obviously accentuating that a cell phone is a help device and would be beneficial in your life. Another sentence tool would be an aphora, which is a type of repetition. It's repetition of the same word or group of words at the beginning of clauses or sentences. We've studied this before. Here's an example. When I am lonely, <coughs> when I am lost, when I am confused, when I need a ride, I can use my cell phone to call for help. And so obviously what you're repeating is the word, are the beginning words of an adverb clause, when I, one, two, three, four times. And it's, it's kind of accentuating that cell phones are used in numerous situations. And um, anaphora also has the added appeal of like catching the ear. You, you notice it with your ear when you're listening to someone using anaphora because it's so obvious, you know, that repetition is kind of poetic in a sort of way. Also, periodic sentences. Now listen to this. This is easy to remember. You know the word period. It's a punctuation mark. It's at the end of a sentence. 
So here's what a periodic sentence is. It's when 